ان الحمد لله نحمد ونستعين ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله indeed all praise is due to allah and as such we should praise him seek his help and seek refuge in him from the evil which is within ourselves and the evil which results from our deeds for whomsoever allah has guided none can misguide and whomsoever allah has allowed to go astray none can guide and i bear witness that there is no god worthy of worship but allah and that muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the last messenger of allah in asqal hadith kitab allah wa khayru hadi hadi muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam wa sharr al umur muhdathatuha wa kull muhdathatin bid'ah wa kull bid'atin dalala wa kull dalalatin fi nar indeed the best form of speech is the book of allah and the purest source of guidance is the guidance brought by Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the worst of all affairs are innovations in religion for every innovation in religion is a cursed innovation a source of misguidance leading ultimately to the hellfire the topic of this evening hijab a religious symbol a question which is raised due to the current state of politics in different parts of the world not only in the west where we have heard about it most recently but actually within the muslim world itself in turkey and tunisia where the wearing of the scarf the head scarf commonly called hijab is forbidden in universities and other governmental institutions the point that i would like to address this evening is that when one takes a practice out of context it will appear strange it is natural that it will appear strange so to the western eye this idea that women should cover their beauty cover themselves appears to be something strange something which is going against the flow of globalization modernization technological development and everything else The reality of course is that for us to understand the hijab we have to look at it within the context of the religion of Islam itself a religion which governs all aspects of life it is not something which a person practices one day a week is the personal and individual decision of the indivi- of a an uh, individual person but it is the way of life of a whole society a way of life which islam teaches was revealed by god first and foremost with the creation of the first human being on this earth adam and his wife eve and all the subsequent prophets who arose amongst human kind missioned by Allah by God the almighty to convey to human kind a message from himself as to how a human being male or female should live their lives this way of life which God taught the prophets and the prophets conveyed to the various peoples to whom they were sent this way of life is known in arabic as islam submission 
to the will of God. We believe as Muslims that there was only one religion which was revealed by God. He did not reveal a variety of different religions so people follow different beliefs and different practices and are at odds with each other. No. God is not the author of confusion. He wants people to be guided to live the way for which he created them. So that religion, which is a comprehensive way of life, has a legacy which we can see today in various parts of the world. That legacy is a legacy of modesty. One which appears in the story of Adam and Eve when they disobeyed God, became aware of their nakedness, their first instinct was to cover themselves. To cover their nakedness. Their private, the private parts of their body. They sought to cover it. And this is a part of the religion of God. As manifest even till today in the scriptures of other major religions as well as in the icons and the images that we can see in various parts of the world. The West which currently raises the biggest objection to hijab when one looks in Christian tradition one finds all of the images where the mother of Jesus the women around Jesus are portrayed wearing hijab. And even when one looks at the garments, even of some of the other ancient societies, whether Egypt or Greece, etc., though they did go through periods of laxity and nakedness, you will still find a basic core of covering the body parts in a modest way. So modesty in general when we go throughout the world is a part and parcel of human society. That people should cover elements of their bodies and if we look at the actual definition of modesty according to Webster's 20th century dictionary it states not displaying one's body. That is the fundamental meaning of modesty. Not displaying one's body. This continues in some sects of Christianity like the Amish and the Mennonites. Their women are completely covered. Women and men. They cover themselves up. Their heads are covered. It may not be in the form of hijab but they cover in a kind of a bonnet etc which they cover them, their heads and this can be found in the scripture in Corinthians in the writings of Paul where he says every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovers dishonors her head it is as as though her head were shaved if a woman does not cover her head she should shave her hair off and if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off, then she should cover her head. And we know the tradition in Roman Catholicism of nuns wearing their garment known as the nun's habit, which covers her in such a way that were it not for the particular style in which they're covered, one would have to say she is covered like a Muslim, hijab wearing hijab. So when we look at the issue of a woman covering herself in what is referred to as hijab and we should know that the term hijab though it is currently understood to mean just a scarf that 
The headscarf in Arabic is really called khimar. And this is mentioned in the Quran as well as in the Sunnah, where women are told to bring their headscarves over their bosoms to cover their bosom areas so that their chest areas would not be exposed. Because the wearing of a head garment was known in Arabia. People did wear it. But they wore it in such a way that it was to the back and their chest areas were exposed. They didn't have buttons and things so necks were cut and body parts tended to be exposed. So the Quran instructed that the head scarves would be brought over the bosoms and they would be covered. Where we do find the term hijab in the Quran, it refers to a barrier between the salt waters and the fresh waters. We find it also referring to a veiling for the wives of the Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, so that none would see them because they were not permitted to work to marry anyone after the Prophet, so that no feelings etc. would develop. They were veiled from the public, except for their relatives. However, the term hijab, it, as I said, has come to refer to the headscarf. So the headscarf is only an element of hijab. And really, the, the concept of hijab involves covering a woman uh, completely, according to most scholars it is except for face and hands according to some scholars it is also including the face but covering her uh, completely when she's outside of her home as well as covering her from uh, males who she could marry within her home because the hijab although people are commonly looking at it as being just the outer garment that is worn when they go outside when a woman goes outside, but also within the home itself. If she's in the home and she has, for example, a brother-in-law, I mean, she must veil herself from him. She cannot uh, appear in a way which would expose her uh, body, whether in the form of dress which is revealing, etc., in front of such individuals. She has to treat that individual who is a brother-in-law, but whom she can marry, uh, just as any other person on the street with regards to veiling herself, maintaining a veil. A veil which is physical in the sense that her body should be covered, but it is also a veil which is emotional in that she hides her emotions, she does not expose her emotions when she speaks with people who are marriageable people, she speaks to them in a business-like way, not in a seductive way, with a lilting voice, etc. This is part of hijab, you could say, from an emotional perspective. And even on an intellectual level, she should also maintain her hijab from the perspective that she is conscious of the importance of modesty. She understands the principles behind the covering. That it is not just a cultural hand-me-down, which she does because her mother, female relatives, did it in her place, in her tribe, in her nation, or whatever, they do it. But she does it because she has understood that it is a requirement from God. It is done with an understanding. And she understands from a religious perspective that when she wears her hijab, she is worshipping God with it. So it is a means of worshipping God. So it is a very comprehensive hijab or veiling. Not limited to the physical act of wearing a particular cloth. A cloth which due to the exaggeration of uh, secular uh, Western societies have turned this into a, an issue done by young girls which would shake a whole nation. 
young girls put on a scarf and go to school and the whole nation shakes. We have to ask ourselves why? Why should the nation shake when young Muslim girls wear this scarf? Because it's only for Muslim girls. Why does the issue of religious symbolism come into play? Where the state argues that excessive display of religion is not tolerated. So a Christian girl, if she wears a small cross, it's okay. But if she wears a big cross, you know, which is two feet by one foot or something, then no, she's not allowed to wear it. But who wears crosses like that anyway? You know? So for the Muslim woman or young girl, she puts a scarf on her head and immediately this is an excessive display of her religion. It is a symbol of religion. It has come to us be associated with religion and Islam in particular because of the awakening which has taken place in the Muslim world in the last 25, 50 to 25 years. Or in the era of colonization of the Muslim world, many women removed their veils. As men changed their dress to become acceptable to the colonial regime, women were also encouraged to change their dress so that they would also be acceptable to that colonial regime. But with the rise of Islam in the 20th century, the most obvious sign of its return was the woman wearing the veil, covering herself with a headscarf as well as covering her body, etc. So it became identified as a symbol of fundamentalism, fundamental Islam, extremism, when in fact it is basic to Islam. So basic that we have the clear statement, for example, in Surah Al-Ahzab, the 33rd chapter of the Quran, verse 59, Ya ayyuhan nabi, qul li azwajika wa banatika wa nisa'il mu'mineen, yudnina alayhinna min jalabi bihinna, thalika adna an yu'arafna wa la yu'dhain. O Prophet, tell your wives, your daughters, and the women of the believers to cast their outer garments over their bodies. That is best in order that they be known and not be harmed. So there's a clear instruction in the Quran for women to wear these garments, to cover themselves. So when we talk about issues of symbolism, we cannot compare the hijab to a cross, which is a symbol. It's a symbol of Christianity or to a dove, which is a symbol of peace. These symbols represent something else. The cross is not Christianity. If a Christian wore a cross or he didn't wear a cross, it would not change the quality of his Christianity. If a person used the symbol of a dove or they didn't use it, that doesn't indicate whether they are a peaceful person or not. The dove is only a symbol of peace. It is not peace in and of itself. Whereas the hijab for a Muslim woman, this is ibadah. It is worship. It is an obligation which God has put on her. Allah Almighty has required her to cover herself. So when we talk about removing the veil, or removing the hijab. It is not the same as a Christian woman removing her cross. No. It would more be equivalent, as some people said, to asking a Christian woman, a practicing modest Christian woman, to remove her blouse. That is what removing hijab for a practicing Muslim woman is like. As a modest practicing Christian woman would be shocked if you suggested to her to take her blouse off. I mean, there are elements in this society 
Western society in particular, that don't have any problem about taking their blouses off. So we have that. But the modest practicing Christian woman who feels that sense of modesty and chastity, etc., she would feel shy to expose herself in that way. Similarly, asking a Muslim woman to take off her hijab creates the same or similar effect. This is the equivalency that we should make. Don't equate it. Let us not equate it to taking off a cross or a star of David or a yarmulke cap worn by the Jews. You know. It is a part and parcel of the religion itself. Now, as I mentioned, even though we accept that it is part and parcel of the religion, it is there for a reason. And it is important for us to understand that reason. Those of us in the audience who are not Muslims. This is not to say one must accept this understanding. At least one should be clear that there is a rationale. There is a reason behind it. Which has nothing to do with oppression of women which is how it is normally portrayed in the media, especially after Afghanistan, you know, as a means of galvanizing uh, forces against that Muslim state. The, the woman covered in the burqa became the symbol of oppression of Muslim women who needed to be liberated. And in you know, Oprah Winfrey, you know, the big figures, female figures in, in uh, the American uh, movie industry, etc. You know, they galvanized uh, the uh, support of the feminists, etc. to try to liberate and educate Muslim women. This was the cause that they were driven and excited about. Reality, of course, is that after the... Uh, removal of the Taliban, traveling in Afghanistan, after they have been quote-unquote liberated, still the vast majority, 99% of Afghan women still wear the burqa. The reality is that they were wearing it before and they would continue to wear it because it was a part of their tradition, they know it is connected with the religion, etc., etc. So, the issue of the veil, the covering of the Muslim woman, should not be looked at as an imposition. Yes, it may be there legally in the Sudan, in Saudi Arabia, in Iran, some Muslim countries. It is a part of the law of the country that women cover themselves. And in fact, that is Islamic law. So it is not an extreme element amongst Muslims who would wish to require it according to state law. It is according to Islamic law. And every country, every society has dress codes. Even in the most liberated of Western societies, women and men are required to maintain a certain minimum of dress in public. Yes, some do allow in limited areas, nudist parks, nudist colonies, nudist beaches, etc. We do find this element there, but in general in society, people are not allowed to walk without any clothing down the main streets. Yes, we do find it in India. There are elements uh, amongst the uh, Hindu uh, priests who believe that the highest way of worshipping God is to you know, go back to one's natural state. So they do walk. You will find in certain parts of India where these priests will come walking into town. They usually stay out in the outskirts in their hermitages or whatever. But they do come in from time to time walking down the main streets stark naked. No. But this is unusual. This says something about Hinduism. 
But anyway, it is not the norm in most societies. Right? Most parts of the world, people do have dress codes which they're obliged to follow. The fact that Islam sets the dress code at the hijab level, one needs to understand what are the principles behind it. If it is not oppression, if Muslim women are not obliged to do this, and we should keep in mind the fact that Islam is the fastest growing religion in America, in Britain, in France, in Germany, etc. And in America in particular, where they have estimated the numbers of people converting to Islam at close to 400 people per day, three quarters of them, meaning three out of every four, are women. We're talking about American women who have grown up with a liberal view with regards to clothing oneself, choosing to cover themselves. So were it oppression, it should become evident in the context of America and, and Britain and these other Western countries. But in fact, what we find is the opposite. Women, when you read the writings of women from the West who have chosen to cover themselves, you will hear them using the term liberation. That it liberates them from the oppression of fashion, the fashion industry which oppresses the woman to the degree that she has to spend so much of her time, you know, fixing this and fixing that and pressing this and pressing that and sewing this and buying this and wearing that and, you know. It frees her. She can leave her home if she wished, having just gotten up out of bed and walk out, nobody knows any difference. She's not obliged to comb her hair in such a way and this and that and go, no. It liberates her. So, when we go and look within the context of the Quranic verse which I mentioned itself, we find in it the reasons which God has prescribed for women to cover themselves. He said there, let them cast their outer garments over themselves. That is best in order that they be known and not be harmed. That they be known and not be harmed. Two principles. That they be known. Known. That the hijab is a costume or a uniform which identifies them. As in every society, there are costumes and uniforms which identify people. The policeman wears a particular costume, so you know it's the policeman. The doctor wears a particular costume, you know he's a doctor. You go into the hospital, you don't go to the orderly or somebody who's cleaning the place and ask him to do a heart operation for yourself. No, he's not wearing that long white coat, you know. You don't ask him for those kind of things. Similarly, the construction worker, he's required to wear a certain kind of helmet, certain kind of boots, etc., etc. Why? That he be protected from harm. That he not be harmed by falling bricks or whatever. So, what you find is, in general, there are a variety of uniforms people wear to either identify themselves or to protect themselves from harm or both. So the dress of the Muslim woman is first and foremost, as we said, her way of one of her ways of worshipping God. It is ibadah, it is worship first and foremost. That's why she needs to know why she's doing it. And she needs to do it according to how it is prescribed not just how she feels. So it becomes a bada or worship of God. That she be known. She be known as what? Because some people mistakenly think that uh, when 
a woman wears her hijab, it's that she not be known. And this is why, unfortunately, many Muslims, or a number of Muslims, coming from this part of the world, will go to the West and transform themselves. It's a phenomenon which I observed when I was first in Saudi Arabia studying. When I would fly home on the plane, women, when they first got on the plane, they would be wearing complete garments. Then when the uh, halfway through the flight, transformation starts. By the time the pilot announces, we'll be landing in New York in so many... You can't see any more of those garments anymore. People walk off this, the plane, you know, looking like Western uh, women in Western dress. And similarly, the opposite, getting on a plane filled with a whole bunch of Westerners, but by the time they announce, we'll be landing in Jeddah, or we'll be landing in Riyadh, all of a sudden, we see all these garments worn again, and people get off the plane completely covered. <laughs> the philosophy of those who do this is that, as it was explained to me, if we wear the hijab in America or Canada, then people are going to stare at us. Men are going to stare at us. And the idea behind hijab is that people don't stare at us, to hide ourselves. So if we're in Saudi Arabia and we didn't wear this, then people would stare at us. But when we wear it, nobody stares at us. But it's the opposite when we go to America and to Canada, to Britain. When we wear it, people stare at us. When we dress like them, nobody stares at us. This is what they say. But Allah explains in the Quran that this garment is that they be known. Not that they be unknown, that they be known. In what sense? That they be known in the same way that a nun in that society is known. Because nuns wearing their full garment are not commonly seen walking the streets, if one comes walking down the street or gets on a bus, the men will stare at her. They will all turn and look at her. Watch her as she walks. Similarly, if a woman in the summer comes out wearing the scantiest of clothing, they will also look at her. You know, gets on the bus, they will look at her walking down the street. But now we have to ask ourselves, are these looks the same? No. One look has one meaning, the other look has another meaning. When they look at the nun, they are looking out of curiosity. Strange, it's all covered up. But they, they don't have behind it any kind of desire. They know that this person is unapproachable. This is a holy person. And truly, when I first came into Islam in Toronto, and uh, my wife started to wear a job covering herself with a scarf, when we used to get on the bus, people used to jump out of their seats and offer a seat. They thought that she was some kind of, you know, nun. And some people even asked her, what order of nuns do you belong to? So there was this respect. And that basically when a Muslim woman wears her hijab, this is the kind of respect that she is seeking. That people, males in particular, would not offer would not approach her in a an sexual way, in a way which is unacceptable Islamically. No. If they have to deal with her, they deal with her in a business-like fashion. As a person, not as a sexual object. Which is the sad state of females in general in the West. In Western society, they have become sexual objects. They are used to sell products. If you want to sell the latest uh, Corvette, what do you do in your ad? 
Do you talk about how big the tires are? How fast it goes? How long it takes to go from zero to 60? The size of the engine? That may be there in small writing. But the message, when they show that image in the magazine, is a red Corvette. With a woman lying on top of it in a bikini. This is the message. You want to sell your Corvette? This is what, how you sell it. Any car, any product, you sell it using the female body. So Islam rejects this. This is un unacceptable. This is dishonorable. This is exploitative. No, a woman should be honored, held in an honored position, and not turned into a sexual object. So her dress is a fashion statement that she is not to be treated in that way. She makes a clear statement to the society around her. Similarly, this dress is to protect her from harm, as Allah said, as God said in the Quran. That they not be harmed. The harm refers to what happens to women in a society in which they are not veiled. Women, when they come in contact with men. And of course, the blame lies on the men, primarily, because all of the harm, or 90% of the harm, is males harming females. Whether it's in the military, how many staff sergeants are now being charged for raping their female, uh, female soldiers under their command. You know, large numbers of decorated heroes, war heroes, charged with rape in the military the Air Force, the Navy, in the medical profession. How many doctors are being charged for abusing their position with female patients? Whatever profession one goes into, where males and females are mixing, women are writing books about the harassment of women on the job. Harassment which is not abating. Harassment in a society where people have ready access to sexual gratification. There's so many products, clubs, a variety of other means that people have, yet women are Law books that very severe punishment. Philippines has taken up that law. India is considering it. Other countries, women are feminists are talking about it. Kill these men. But can we really apply such a severe law without a balance from the side of the women that they are also required to cover their charms it's not fair to just kill a man who steps out of line and the woman is free to expose herself she might say well listen I when I wear my mini skirt right my halter top or whatever I am not inviting men. This is not my intention. My intention is just to look nice. This is the style and this is what is considered to be nice and that's how I want to look. But this is not the point. The consequence is that men are attracted in this way. Common sense tells us that we should avoid this kind of clothing to minimize the abuse the harassment which is taking place in the society. This is common sense. For example, in Canada, 
Some years back, about five years ago, women argued for the right in summer to walk the street topless. Since in summer, men commonly will wear shorts and go walking down the main streets topless. Right? They call it bare-chested. They said women should have the right to do that. Because if a woman did it, she would be arrested for lewd conduct. I said, why? Why should we be arrested for lewd conduct when the men are able to do this? You know, men and women are equal. No, if that's what we said in the Constitution, they're equal, so we should have the right. They argued and won. In Ontario, Toronto and the rest of Ontario, it is permissible for a woman, in summer, because this is when they would do it, to walk down the main streets topless. However, since that law was passed five years ago, there is no record of a single woman doing it. Why? Common sense tells them that if they did it in public, in the, going down the main streets, they would suffer. They would suffer. So they choose not to do it. That's common sense telling them. So similarly, when we talk about dress, we should keep this in mind, that women should be required to cover themselves, and at the same time we should have strong laws dealing with those who are involved in rape, who would harm women in this way. And there's an article I have here, which is from the USA Today, called Men, Women and Sex, We Need Your Help. Darren Snyder, a reporter for USA Today, non-Muslim, he's, write, he's writing, he says, Do your skirts have to be so short? Do your jeans have to be so tight? Can't your clothing be less provocative? He's a non-Muslim writer. And he goes into discussing the need on the part of women who complain about harassment of men, that they should also dress themselves in a more modest way. And he actually states in here, he says, talking about the men first, and he puts the blame, he says, yes, men, it's men's fault. He says that that's the men's fault. But he says, it's, diff it's a difficult dilemma for women. Many women, many men have one-track minds. Even if women wore bed sheets and drapes, some men would still be able to indulge in whatever visions tickle their fantasies. But if you dressed, say, in long flowing, loose fitting garments, like some traditional Muslim women, you don't have to cover your face in my book, he said, this is him. Uh, it would be easier on men trying to overcome the entrenched notion of man as a sexual hunter gatherer. He said, Men need your help. Our spirit is willing but our flesh is weak. So, this is a non-Muslim writing on this matter. This is reality. So when we look at uh, the, the rates of rape, for example, in North American society, where if we just look at three years, 1994, 1995, 1996. In 1994, you had... 251,560 rapes and sexual assaults. In 1995, you had 354,670. In 1996, you had 432,000. Sorry, what figures am I using here? First one was 251,560 in 94, 354,670 in 95 and 432,330 in 96. We're jumping almost by 100,000 every year. This is a trend, which you can extrapolate backwards to the turn of the century, so that the graph appears to be going down. It's rising as we go forward into the 2000 and 2001, 2002. If we look at that graph, and we look at the graph for women's clothing from the turn of the century, where women used to go bathing in full dresses in America, 
Women went bathing in full dresses. And men even covered themselves completely. Till today, where people go bathing virtually naked, wearing bits and pieces of clothing, they call bikinis and a variety of other things, but in fact they're virtually naked. You see a graph going in the opposite direction, going from fully dressed to fully undressed. Rapes going from few to many. There is a correlation. Yes, there are figures which have to do with rape, and yes, that you know it tends to happen amongst those people who are in the families, etc. It's not that the strangers are fewer, but even amongst the strangers, I'm just saying that the rate of strangers committing rape is on the rise. And if we put rape aside and just go and, and the figures they have in America, they said every minute five women are raped in America. Every minute, five women are raped in America. Leaving those figures aside, just go to the harassment. The reality is that harassment is on the increase. So, harm. Harm is directed at women in a very obvious way. Islam prescribes the hijab the garment to protect the woman and also to identify her in the society. It is not a means of oppression. Though some people might oppress with it. I'm not saying that that does not occur somewhere in the world that there are some people oppressing with a hijab as people may oppress with virtually anything. But as a basic principle in the religion of Islam, it is not a principle of oppression, but one of protection and identification. It is one in practice of liberation for the woman, as we said, from the oppression of the fashion industry. And if we look at the goals of dress in general, in Muslim society, we find that the first goal is the covering of the private parts. Second is the protection from the elements. And third is beautification and attraction. Primary is covering the private parts. Secondary, protection from the elements. And thirdly, That global culture which is coming on MTV and you know all the other sources. We can see that the primary purpose of clothing is beautification and attraction. Beautification and attraction. And after that it is protection from the elements. And last, it is covering the privates. It's the total opposite. This is why you will find in the dead of winter, in Chicago, where the cold wind known as the hawk, you know, rips through you, you know, at 20, 30 degrees below zero, you know, you shiver. Just thinking about it, you will find women walking out in mini skirts in the dead of winter. How? What is the intent here? Obviously, it is attraction of the opposite sex. Well, the woman might say, as I said, it's just style. But the bottom line, the fashion industry is geared towards attraction. That is the goal. So, Islam seeks to bring all of these principles uh, under control. It's a part of a system. And this system actually does not exclude men. The system actually does not exclude men. There is hijab for men too. No, they're not required to wear the scarf, the khimar, but they are required to cover their bodies primarily between the navel and the knee. That is the minimum. Should be covered in a loose garment. 
which does not form and shape the private parts and expose it. That is the requirement. Unfortunately, many men today in the Muslim world, while being very vigilant to ensure that their women are properly covered, will leave their homes improperly covered. They will wear garments which in fact expose their private parts. Garments which they wouldn't accept for their wives, their daughters, etc. But they are wearing it themselves. And this is something that men also need to keep in mind. So, in summing up the topic, hijab. Hijab, as it faces the secular system which is now being globalized. Secularism which seeks to remove religion from all elements of government and public policy. Which says basically religion is all the same. You can follow whichever one you wish, but don't use it as a symbol. Don't symbolize it in public, schools, etc. This global culture which is coming finds in front of it the Islamic culture. There's a clash, head-on clash. Islamic culture which requires that a woman cover herself. This is a part of the religion. Yes, some Muslims may be lax, not practice it properly in different parts of the world. But as a whole, the Muslim nation recognizes that this principle of modesty is a part and parcel of the religion. So it will stand in opposition to the culture which calls to nudity, calls to liberalizing and liberation exposure which is transformed or manifest in the exposure of the bodies of males and females and in particular in the case of females so there is a clash happening that clash does not have to be if that global culture accepts cultural differences. It accepts the right of people to practice their religion as it has been prescribed. Then there is no need for the clash. They accept the principle of hijab within the context of Islam. Within the context of a system which promotes modesty encourages, prescribes modesty. That this is the right of that system and those involved in the system to practice this. So if those who are currently raising such a clamor against the hijab were to wake up to the realities and accept it and embrace it as a part of the cultural diversity of human beings, then there is no problem. In fact, those countries that see schoolgirls wearing a scarf, Muslim schoolgirls wearing a scarf as a challenge to the system, they want them to conform. They want them to be absorbed by the culture the home culture. That is their goal. In fact, banning the headscarf will not achieve that goal. It will actually defeat it. Because many Muslim families will choose instead to take their children out of schools, the state schools, and put them into Muslim schools where their values will be reinforced. 
And where, as the society sees it, fundamentalism will thrive. So actually, they are shooting themselves in their feet. The goal that they intend will not be achieved by the methods that they are applying. So hijab, though it is a symbol of an awakening to Islam, it is among the practices of Muslims. It is not a religious symbol in and of itself. It has symbolic value, but it is not a religious symbol in and of itself. It is an act of worship. It is a religious obligation. And as such, Muslims as well as non-Muslims need to understand it in this context. And having understood it, then the problems which we are facing today in the Muslim world as well as the non-Muslim world, though most of the problems seem to be in the non-Muslim world, these can be resolved quite easily. Because Islam is not confrontational. It is not a violent religion. It doesn't seek to impose its way on people. It is a religion which thrives in peace, in times of peace. It spreads most rapidly when there aren't tensions, when there aren't conflicts. When we consider the spread of Islam to Indonesia, 200 million Muslims, not a single Muslim soldier set for the largest Muslim country became a Muslim country from trade, merely from the trade of Muslim traders leaving Western, South, 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 Southeastern Arabia, Oman, Yemen, traveling there and trading. So, in summary, Islam is a complete way of life. The hijab is a part and parcel of that way of life. It is not imposed and it is not oppression. It is a means of worship for females. They worship God by wearing it. And it is also practically in the society a means of identifying themselves and a means of protecting themselves from harm. It also protects the society from the harm which comes from exposure. So it protects themselves and it protects the society as a whole. The hijab is not only a physical garment worn, but it is also a state of mind a state of emotion where a person, a female, wears that garb to worship God and maintains all of the requirements of that garb in all of their dealings in the society, whether outside their homes or within their homes, whether among males or even among females. There are requirements in dress. Though it may be relaxed amongst females, it is not relaxed to zero. There are still requirements of Muslim females, even in the presence of other Muslim females. Similarly, hijab is not restricted to females. It is also a part and parcel of male dress. There are requirements hijab requirements of modesty, of covering, of maintaining a, an even keel in the society with regards to sexuality, sensuality, that it is kept under control. Though today, from a Western perspective, when one thinks of the veil and the, and the um, this, uh, hijab, the image which comes up in many people's minds is that of the 
thousand and one nights the harem the women belly dancers you know this is some of the images which con people conjure up of course these are stories entertainment novels fiction yes there may be elements of truth in them but the whole truth is that the veil the hijab is an, uh, an element or an instrument of worship in Islam and not one of heightened sensuality it in fact lowers it in the society and this is the purpose for which Islam prescribed it with that I conclude my presentation and uh, we will give you an opportunity now for questions a females uh, may give their questions there is amongst you uh, one of the sisters who can take those questions down to her father uh, brother Niaz who can uh, collect them and bring them forward uh, questions from males uh, we can take them in the written form uh, as well as uh, if you'd like to just raise your hand uh, we can also take questions directly from the floor Go ahead. Wa alaikum salam. Okay, brother's question concerning niqab or the face veil is this a must and a requirement for Muslim women? Well, this is an issue over which Muslim scholars have differed. Some hold that it is not an obligation. But those who hold it's not an obligation hold that it is a strong recommendation. And others hold that it is an obligation. You do have an element amongst modernists who would even go so far as to claim that it isn't an obligation at all. Uh, even the, the khimar or the scarf itself. But this is something cultural. And that modesty is only a principle and a an idea that can vary from society to society and as long as you maintain what may be classified as modesty you're okay so if you're in the West what constitutes modesty which might constitute nakedness in the Muslim world is okay you know but this is of course an extreme view which steps outside of the bounds of Islamic law An Egyptian scholar stated that France is permitted to pass a law banning hijab. Muslims should move to Muslim countries. What is your view, especially for Muslims whose home is in the West? Well, whether France is permitted to or not, that is up to them. Of course, it's their country. They can do what they want to do in the country. But it is something which may be fought legally because there are also people... Uh, from various uh, areas of uh, human rights who have actually opposed this. There is uh, an article which is available on the internet uh, written by the, uh, one of the big human rights uh, organizations in which they recommend that they call on France actually to take this back Human Rights Watch they said the proposed law is an unwarranted infringement on the right of to religious practice said Kenneth Roth executive director of Human Rights Watch for many Muslims wearing a headscarf is not only about religious expression it is about religious obligation he has understood the crux of the matter he said some supporters of the proposed law known as the draft law concerning the application of the principle of secularism in schools junior high schools and high schools which would come into force in September believe it is necessary to uphold the separation of church and state in education and to protect the secular state from the perceived threat of religious fundamentalism particularly Islamic fundamentalism However, protecting the rights of all students to religious freedom does not undermine secularism in schools. On the contrary, it demonstrates respect for religious diversity 
a position fully consistent with maintaining the strict separation of public institution from any particular religious message. Human Rights Watch recognizes the legitimacy of public institutions seeking not to promote any religion via their conduct or statements. But the French government has taken this step further by suggesting that the state is undermining secularism if it allows students to wear religious symbols. So this is Human Rights Watch, a non-Muslim organization opposed to the ban which is being proposed in France. Now, Muslims should move to Muslim countries. Well, I mean, this of course is something which may not be practical at all. Of course, Muslims, wherever they find that practicing Islam becomes difficult, they are obliged to migrate, to make hijra. This is an obligation which remains on Muslims until the last day. So the obligation to migrate is a general obligation which Muslims are faced with wherever they are, even in Muslim countries where they have difficulty practicing Islam, they're obliged to migrate to another area where they can better practice Islam. As for the majority of Muslims, for example, in Western countries who cannot migrate, their responsibility is to try to implement Islam as best they can and to convey the message of Islam to the non-Muslim society in which they live. In case a woman is alone in her home, what clothing should she wear? Well, if she's absolutely alone, of course, there is, uh, she's free, she has to take a bath, whatever. I mean, people take baths, they don't usually wear clothing when they take baths, you know, so but it means that sometimes she may take off all of her clothing. So it depends on the circumstance, you know. She is not, she doesn't have any particular uh, minimum which is prescribed, but, uh, but for herself, whatever she feels, you know, most comfortable in, within the bounds of her own personal modesty, uh, then she is permitted to wear as she wishes, within the bounds of her own home when she's alone. What is the exact wear, way of wearing the veil? Oh, this is the same question we looked at earlier. What is the sin for not wearing hijab? Well, of course, this is disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah Almighty, women who expose themselves, uh, depending on the severity of the case, could end up uh, it being a source of punishment for them on the Day of Judgment, uh, in the hellfire, to some degree, for some period of time, or whatever. It just depends on the severity of their acts. Uh, but in general, uh, Muslim, a Muslim is required to try to obey Allah's commands as much as they can. The nature of women and men are different. Isn't it also the nature or the way a man is created according to the Quran as one of the reasons why men look at women in desirous ways? Yes, it is. Uh, from the nature of men that they are more easily aroused by females just looking at them etc it is part of the difference and this is why Allah when speaking about the covering says tell the men Muslim men the believing men that they should lower their gaze and guard their private parts. They're told. As women are told, they're also told. Question two, is this conforming by other countries, the banning of the hijab for Muslims, a sign that non-Muslims are fearful of Islam? Yes, it does represent something of a fear. They see in Islam this wearing of the, the hijab, a fundamentalist uh, upsurge, and they link it to terrorism, which of course is a false link, because fundamentalism, going back to the fundamentals of Islam, is something required of all Muslims. And this has no link with terrorism. Terrorism is something else. A person may be a, an atheist and a terrorist. 
He could be, you know, a, a Muslim who is not practicing Islam and he's a terrorist. It doesn't necessarily link with practicing Islam. So, it's a misunderstanding on the part of many people in the West, unfortunately promoted by the media, that fundamentalism means terrorism. If women wear complete hijab, covering the face, then identification will be difficult, as per the, for the Prophet saying that they should be identified when she goes with a man. Well, I don't know about that saying. In fact, the idea is that she is not identifiable, easily identifiable. It is sufficient that she knows who her husband is and uh, where they have to meet. It is not necessary that the husband be able to identify his wife, you know, when she is amongst other women in a similar dress. This is not a necessity. Some parents say, I will leave it up to my daughter to decide what do you have to say to them. Well, it's a mistake. This is a mistake. It is something which Allah has already decided. So to say I will leave it up to my daughter to decide is to go against the commandment of Allah. Is to give the right to, of decision which belongs to Allah to your daughter. This is a big mistake. Of course, many Muslims who are not applying Islam properly find themselves in a difficult situation when they recognize culturally that a girl has now become a young woman and she needs to be covered and they ask her to cover and she doesn't want to they have to struggle with this then they say okay I'll leave it up to you but the reality is that the Prophet ﷺ said, teach your children prayer by the time they're seven. Teach them prayer by the time they're seven. Teaching them prayer involves teaching them hijab. Because to teach a young girl how to pray, it doesn't mean the physical actions alone. It means the dress that it accompanies it. That she must cover herself accordingly what is acceptable for prayer. And she learns that dress from the time she's seven. By the time she reaches puberty, you'll not have any problems uh, encouraging her to wear the hijab because she'll already be doing it. Maybe not as complete. Maybe at that time she wears it in the most complete sense. So, that only becomes a problem for those people who are not following the prophetic instructions. How long would it take for Arab women to take off the hijab, going at the present trends? Well, I'm not a fortune teller, so I really can't give you an answer to that one. And in any case, you know, these trends are cyclic. If we were to go to Egypt, for example, 60 years ago, you would hardly find any woman wearing a scarf. Hardly find it. Today, you can't go anywhere without finding women wearing scarves. When I was in Malaysia in the 60s, I lived in East Malaysia, which is a Muslim country. I never saw a single woman in hijab. Not a single woman. Not one. Even, I found myself when I went to Medina to study, during Hajj, and I saw these women that looked like the women of Malaysia, all covered up, you know, except for their face and hands. I asked some friends of mine, where are these people from? You know, because they look like Malaysia. They said, Malaysia. I said, what? <laughs> I never saw anybody dressed like that in Malaysia. You know, because what they would do, 
they knew that when you pray you have to cover yourself they would carry these garments in bags when they go to the mosque and then they when they get inside they put it on and they pray in it and put it back in the bag and leave so I never saw it the whole time I was there in Malaysia now when I went back in the 90s it was everywhere the school the public places everywhere so, so even if you may find a society leans at one point towards a relaxing the overall trend of Islamic awakening will help it come back in line so I don't fear so I don't fear for the future in that regard uh, question you speak of extremes in the West topless miniskirt etc but are gloves niqabs to the point where women cannot see etc not extreme as well why can there not be a respectful middle ground of conservative modest dress thank you well uh, the degree to which a woman covers herself if she chooses to cover herself to the point as you said where she can't see well I mean of course that may be a bit of an extreme you know where it's gonna hinder your walking you're bumping into poles and falling and tripping and things like this so we said this is an extreme you should at least have a minimum of being able to maneuver in society right so but still even with the niqab and the glove we can't say niqab and the glove is is extreme uh, if it is sanctioned by the religion and a woman chooses to do so then that is her option there is no harm coming from it to the society or to herself there's no harm coming from it uh, to the society and, and to herself in fact one recent study a uh, doctor I was reading talking about societies where women wear the face veil have fewer incidences of um, nose and throat infections because it acts as a screen screening out so there's benefits in fact now if we go to the other extreme you know where people the topless and the miniskirt we say there's this harm there's obvious harm there you know so where are we gonna find the modest means okay uh, what do you consider modest this what you consider modest another person may not consider modest you know? so we have difficulties if it's left to the individual to decide then we have problems this is why as Muslims we say leave it to God let God decide because we really don't know what's best for us so this is the, the Islamic approach to it as I said abuse of women you know um, <clears throat> harassment of women in general sexual harassment of women which sometimes may reach the point of rape but many times many other times it's not to that point uh, we <clears throat> we do common sense does tell us that this is going to be related to clothing this is just basic for a person to say no it has nothing to do with clothing if I wear a bikini it's not going to excite men and in fact if I wear a complete covering you can't see anything of me that might even excite them yes there may be a man excited by that but all men are excited by the bikini that's reality you know let us not fool ourselves okay our time's running out we have hit the um, uh, the hour of 10 o'clock and though we have a number of questions remaining uh, what I can do is maybe I'll save them for the center we can answer them at the Qatar Guest Center where we have regular classes in the evening I have regular Friday classes there I can answer some of them in my question and answer period because uh, time will not permit going through all of them and uh, if you didn't receive a brochure before leaving please collect one uh, which uh, informs you about the Qatar Guest Center which is the main body involved with setting up this program and inshallah we'll be having other public programs